friends, good morning and welcome to Rise and Shine, our daily Bible study to inspire, inform, and impact your life in ways you never imagined possible. We're now in chapter 9 of John's Gospel. Uh, John continues to open up and reveal more about Jesus' identity uh, coming from above. Uh, in the last chapter, Jesus proclaimed in the midst of the light ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles, I am the light of the world. For people that were living in darkness, or especially in the October festival of tabernacles, the light is decreasing, people are getting ready for winter. And so in the midst of that spiritual kind of moment where people are very aware, very sensitive to the decreasing of light, the coming of winter, Jesus proclaims in the midst of the darkness, I am the light of the world. John's gospel is more about than what is just on the page. It's about going behind it to see the context. And so one of the things that you'll often hear writers say is you have to know the address where the events are taking place. You have to know what is happening in that location. What did tabernacles mean to the people that were living there? Because John squarely puts Jesus' events, these events, in the Feast of Tabernacles. And so we've talked about how from chapter 1 to chapter 12 of the book of the signs, the, the revelation of Jesus about understanding what does it mean to be a disciple, um, to be able to make those decisions about what is really going on, just more than just the, the cross and the resurrection, but how does that impact the world in which we live? And we see that in chapter 1, we understand that he describes Jesus as the Word of God. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So He is the logic. He is the reason of God. He is the mind of God. He was with God, and through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made. In Him is life, life that is different than just physical life. Um, he is life. And that life is the light of the world, right? So we're, and, and then it goes on to say, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. So we see from the very beginning this contrast, right? Light and darkness, good, evil, light, life, death. We see these are at odds with one another. And throughout our journey together up until chapter 9, we've had these encounters with different characters that have struggled to understand. Some of them... Uh, painfully, some with strong opposition, with antagonism, uh, but certainly some with curiosity. We've, we've encountered Nicodemus. We've certainly had interaction with his disciples. We've had the woman at the well, uh, the Samaritan woman. Um, and as we've gone through, and even with his disciples, struggling to understand when Jesus said, I am the, uh, the bread from heaven, and you have to feast on my flesh and drink my blood, certainly raised some serious eyebrows. But for those of us that are reading this, uh, this scripture, we, we understand a lot more about what Jesus is saying and what more he is inviting us into. Well, today we're going to go even deeper. In chapter 8, we realize that there was a lot of antagonism. Jesus now begins to talk about where he has come from. Um, and he talks about what it means to be a disciple. And he says in uh, verse 11, if you hold to my teaching, well, it, that means you have to be a student, right? You, you have to be a learner. And the question is for all of us, and fortunately you're here this morning, are we really students? You have to be my disciples. Uh, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. You are learning from me. Um, you know, and the question really is, is how many of our brothers and sisters um, just kind of show up on Sunday morning, but do not go deeper, are, are not willing to go to that higher ground, that higher level of, of wisdom and learning. And so Jesus kind of calls them out. Well, that causes antagonism um, and division. And so the light of Jesus coming into the world causes division and causes choices. Well, you see the, the antagonism in chapter 8. In chapter 9, we're going to ask, what impact does that antagonism have on us as disciples? How do we live that out in a hostile environment? Okay, so I want you from the very beginning to look for the signs, the way John is going to craft this chapter, because it, has, it is a powerful story, and it is, it is really a kind of another character um, description, another character story, very much like 
Nicodemus and the woman at the well, we're now going to see what does it mean to be a disciple? How is that going to impact us? If we choose to follow the light, what should we expect? Okay. Now, we're, we are the church. We're the body of Christ, um, called by Him to be disciples, to go out and make new disciples. So let us pray for our church and for its witness in these troubled days. Father, I pray that you'll bring new life and blessings to Mount Pleasant far beyond anything that we could ask or imagine. Amen. You know, I pray that God does wonderful things that only He can do, uh, brings new light and new hope, uh, challenge us to move out of our complacency and into the bold, beautiful light of, of a new day. That requires us to be courageous. Um, for you, that may mean inviting someone to our Bible study. That may mean uh, getting in touch with a neighbor or a friend and sharing the light that you have already begin, given. People that live in the light uh, are courageous. It's those that live in the shadow of self-doubt um, and, and need the sense of God's leading um, that need the courage of God. So let us pray for a courageous heart for all of us. God, grant me a courageous heart, willing to explore the unknown, trusting your voice to guide me. Save me from the emptiness of easy answers and safe shelters. Let me be bold and brave, willing to sacrifice temporary comforts and simple answers to find wonders beyond my wildest dreams. My heart tells me I was made for more and that all these things are possible with your help. So grant me courage to take the next bold step. Amen. Okay, chapter 9 is well-crafted. It is a well-crafted story from beginning to end, and I'm hoping today you get a lot out of this to see how the narrative weaves a constant and powerful story, all line, all the way from beginning to end. Okay, so let us begin in chapter 9, verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God may be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with a saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. The word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? They asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. Then he told me to go to Siloam and wash. I went and washed and there I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. The Pharisee, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him uh, how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. Have, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is he the one who says he was born blind? How is it that he can see? We know he is our son, the parents muttered, and we know he, is, he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, 
What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have already told you and you did not listen. Why do you not, do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You are steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and went and found him. And he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him, heard him say this and ask, What? Are we blind too? And Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Is this not a fantastic story? Um, it involves just, the, it gives us some insight into what it means to be a disciple how this process uh, unfolds. Um, if you remember, in chapter 7, uh, Jesus says, you know, all those who thirst come to me, and, and I will satisfy, I will give you living water. In chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now, in chapter 9, he heals a man, and he, you see this transformation that happens in the life of a disciple. And the question that really chapter 9 is going to face is, Jesus is facing this opposition. Will his disciples face the same kind of opposition as we go through our journey as well? Okay, so let's look at the symbolism, how this drama is playing out. First of all, it tells us that as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. What, what does that mean? It means the man lives in darkness, right? Your eyes don't work. Everything is around you is dark. You, you cannot find your way. You, you cannot see the world as it really is. And so if somebody were to describe to you, if you were born blind from birth, and somebody were to describe, say, a tree, a cloud, a sunset, you have no frame of reference. You, you have no context, okay? Now, we're going to use this not just for his physical blindness, but his spiritual blindness. We've just kind of come out of chapter... Um, chapter 8, where Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Okay, but to people that are living in darkness. And so you're going to see that people struggle, that are born blind, struggle with this idea of light and dark. They have no frame of reference. Now, there was this idea that in, in Judea, um, in Jerusalem, and basically it still permeates us today, right? That if bad things happen to you, you must have done something wrong. There's this simple philosophy, right? If you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. And so, of course, the question was, here we have this man who was born blind from birth. So somebody sinned, right? Something must have happened. And so the question that has been kind of laid out there is, is blindness here, does it come as a direct result of sin? Is, is his darkness, the, the darkness that he is experiencing, is that a direct result of sin, of his sin? And so, of course, his, um, his disciples, as they're walking with him, say, um, hey, Master, look at this guy. Um, what do we know? Why did these things happen? Did he sin or did his parents sin that his eyes don't work? And, of course, Jesus said, no, this... This disability that he has um, is not a, 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 a direct result of, of sin that is being metered out by God um, against his parents or against him. Right? But he kind of goes on. Now, we're going to use this a little bit later on. Again, 
make the parallel, make the connection between his blindness and spiritual darkness that we've been talking about. Jesus comes to bring light, right? He comes to, to open us and give us a, a second chance. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I used this the other day in um, uh, Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 4, people living in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of shadows, a light has dawned, right? So to a man that is born blind, Jesus comes to bring light into his life. Okay, now there's a little play that is used here um, because, again, remember John is writing to a Greek audience. So Jesus um, tells him to, you know, he, he puts some mud on his eyes, but then he tells him to go down and wash in the pool of Siloam, which in Hebrew, he wants you to tell you that what it means is sent. Now, why, why would that be important? Who, who really cares? Well, if you think about it, I mean, Jesus is telling us that he is the sent one, right? So he's telling this man, if you want to be healed, go to the pool of scent. Go to where the one, the, the one come from heaven, sent from heaven, is t telling you to go to the pool that is sent. Right? So there's this double use of the word, trying to drive home the point to the reader that it's to the one that is sent that we must go. So, okay, so he, he goes, he washes, and he is healed. Jesus heals him of his blindness. He can now see. But does that mean that he is spiritually aware, that he is a, a disciple now? Now, just because his eyes work, so now we're going to start working on the other end of the spectrum. Now that his eyes can work, can he spiritually see what is going on around him? And now this is where it's going to play out with the other characters that are happening in, the, in, in this drama. Because, of course, what is happening? The man uh, was born blind. He had uh, sat in, in the marketplace and he had begged. And so now all of a sudden he is up walking around. And, of course, people that saw him created quite a stir. But instead of just saying, oh, he's healed, they're saying... That, that doesn't happen, right? That never happens. Um, it, gotta be, it has to be somebody else. It must only be somebody who looks like him. And of course, the man says, no, I am the one who was here. Okay, so now, now you have to really deal with this. Here you have a true miracle and a sign. He was born blind, and so people were saying, how did this happen, right? How does somebody that is blind from birth there's nothing that you could do. It wasn't just an illness. What has happened to you? And we find out later that the, the real crux of the problem is this happened on the Sabbath. Now, we've had this happen before where Jesus heals a man at Bethsaida, at the pool of Bethsaida, um, on the Sabbath. And it reminds us that Jesus takes on the festival of the Sabbath because he wants him to know um, that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. All right, so now we start going through, and people start questioning him. He starts becoming interrogated. Well, first of all, he starts to become interrogated uh, by his neighbors, by the friends that are around him. Um, what happened to you? How did this happen? Um, and he is oblivious. Now, the point here is that for true discipleship, right, he's not really a disciple yet. He certainly had an encounter with Jesus. He had an eye-opening experience, right? I mean, a life-altering experience with Jesus, but he doesn't know Jesus. So discipleship is a two-sided coin. Have you had an experience with Jesus that is life-changing, life-altering? And two, do you know Jesus? Now, you, you might think that they are one and the same, but they're not. I mean, if you think about it, you can study Scripture and know verses inside and out and still not have the tenderness and the humility of having your eyes opened by Jesus. By the same token here, you can have a wonderful mountaintop experience where you feel elation, you feel joy, but you never do the work to know who Jesus is or what His mission is. They go hand in hand. And so here you have a man who was born blind, now can see. And he has got to be just elated and just 
ecstatic that his whole world is opened up to him. But who is Jesus? I, I, I don't know. Okay, But that's going to play itself out. We're going to see he's going to learn more about this. So they brought the man to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are going to investigate this because they need to, there, there's a, there's a uh, sort of a contradiction that is happening here. First of all, they know that if you are born blind, th- again, this is the Pharisees' mentality. This is a Jewish, uh, a, a religious mentality. If this man were born blind, then either he sinned or his, his parents sinned. Somebody sinned for this to happen. The other thing that we know is that Jesus, this miracle happened on the Sabbath. Well, how can, how can you break the Mosaic law because that's a miracle and yet break the law, which is what a sinner does? And so there's this, this, uh, this problem, this conflict that is happening. Um, he says this man in, in verse 16, this man cannot be from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. Jesus cannot be from God. He does a miracle which only comes from God, but he can't be from God because of the Sabbath. And so, you know, and of course the man comes back, other people say, but right, how can sinners do such signs, not miracles, signs? So what is the sign that he is pointing to? What, what does this have to do with? And so they go back to the blind man again. If you'll notice, he finally gets frustrated. They go back to him over and over again. And they say, what, what do you say about him? Um, it, it was your eyes, and, and the man is beginning to, to come together. Not quite there. He said he's a prophet, right? He has to be a man of God, right? Because only God can heal me of my blindness. I know where I was. This goes back to the song, right, by John Newton. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. It's amazing grace. He's beginning to, to awaken. His eyes are open. But now his eyes spiritually are beginning to open. He's beginning to see what's really happening. Um, so now, okay, the Pharisees don't believe him. They, this, they, they look at this guy and they say, okay, look, we don't have anything to do with you. We're going to go talk to your parents. The parents are wonderful, right? So they go to the parents. Now, this is a big deal because they know that anybody that disagrees with us, we're going to throw out of the, out of the uh, synagogue. Now, to get thrown out of the synagogue means that you are an outcast. Um, If you don't mind, it would be um, like in an Amish community to be shunned, right? You you have no community. And so this was a big deal. This wasn't just being, well, I'll go to another church. This was to be thrown out of your community. How would you live? How would you work? How would you do life when, when people were shunning you? So this was not a trivial thing. So they go to him and they say, tell me about this, this son of yours. What, what's he up to? What's the prank that's going on? And he said, yes, we know this is our son. Yes, we know that he was born blind. How his eyes were opened, we don't know. Um, but that's not our problem. That's him. He's old enough. He can speak for himself. You go talk to him. That's why they said, you go ask him, right? This is his deal, not ours. So they're kind of throwing him under the bus a little bit here. So the second time, they call the man in, and they, they urge him, okay, look, stop lying before God. Give God glory by telling the truth, right? Give us the, the right answer. Basically, what they're saying is, give us the answers that we are looking for. Um, we know, they say, give us the truth, but we already know that this man um, is a sinner. And the guy goes, oh, look... I, I don't know. Is he a sinner? I I don't know. But one thing I do know is I was blind, but now I see. Okay, I I know about my... And and here's what I want to ask you um, for the listener today. You have to know what Jesus has done for you. You should be able, at, at the drop of a hat, say, what has Jesus done for you? Otherwise, you have no experience, right? This man said, look, how that happened, I don't know. How Jesus died and saved me from my... I don't know. How does the Holy Spirit work within me? I don't know. But this is what I do know. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Um, Little aside. um, Washington Duke, who basically built Duke University, 
um, had a son, Benjamin, who he called Buck. And I always remembered that he, this was back in the turn of the century, um, and he, he said, there are three things that I do not understand. He said, I do not understand electricity, I do not understand the work of the Holy Spirit, and I do not understand my son, Buck. It's the same kind of deal. Jesus said, you know, the Holy Spirit comes and moves as it will, right? So this man is saying, look, I don't know. Here's what I do know. Here's what he has done for me here and now. And they say, how did he open your eyes? He said, wait a minute. This is the third time you've asked me this. You know, you're not listening. And again, why? Because they are blind. You, you can't see it. This is what you're starting to see. This man's eyes, both physically and spiritually, are becoming open while it is revealing the darkness and the blindness of the Pharisees. He said, I've told you three times and you won't believe. And then he kind of goes on and he said, and I think he, he says this honestly, do you really want to become his disciples too? He said, I can help you. I can point you in the right direction. Because the point is, is that he's saying, look, I, I've, I've experienced something transformational, right? We all need that moment. True discipleship is wisdom. Who is Jesus? And second, have you had an experience, a personal encounter with Jesus? And of course, then what happens? As soon as he says, you want to be his disciples, they go nuts. They hurl insults at him. You are this fellow's disciple. We are Moses' disciples. So right away, what you find is Jesus is creating, you have to make a choice. The letter of the law or the spirit of the law. Are you Moses' disciples or are you Jesus' disciples? Okay? And so you see this conflict that Jesus introduces the choices that we have to make in, in making this, divi- this division. Um, we, and then finally they go on, they say, we don't even know where he comes from. Well, that happened in the last chapter, right? Where Jesus said, you know, tell us where you're from. And he said, basically, he said, I'm from above, but you can't understand that. In your current state, you will not understand where I have come from until I'm lifted up. Okay? So the Pharisees were very big on trying to figure out where he is, he is from. Now, what we're seeing here is the evolution, if you will, of a disciple. And understanding that when you become a disciple, you should expect conflict as well. You should expect interrogation. You should expect family members, friends, neighbors to say, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand why you go to this Bible study. I don't understand why you are so strict about going to Sunday school or worship. Can't you just be more flexible? Because they cannot understand it. They are in the dark. But think about the man who now can see. He can see the world completely different. He can see the texture. He can see the beauty. He can see the the grandeur of the world that God has given. And he will not be silenced, right? He will not stop. So they go and say that um, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That's the final statement, right? Will they accept that, right? That's the key. Nobody has ever opened somebody's eyes that born blind. This man um, could do nothing if he were not from God. Do you accept that? So what happens in blindness? Well, we can't see where we're going. We're, we can't see other people around us. We're ignorant of the situation in which we live. And so we see this struggle then between This man who is blind but now can see making this grand statement. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, what they say is, look, you were born blind. You are steeped in sin. Sin is at the key here, right? Now they're bringing back in this issue of sin. Because of your sin, you are blind, you are ignorant, and you are unclean in our our worldview. And that... Sin has caused your blindness. Now, that's coming back to haunt them, right? In the beginning, the disciples began by saying, "Um, Rabbi, somebody sinned, right, that this man is born blind. And here at the end, 
They say, we're going to reject your statement because sin created your blindness. But now, the writer of John wants you to think about that thought again. Does sin, what is called heremetia, does that sin cause us blindness so that we cannot see? And the answer is yes. Sin causes us spiritual blindness, right? So here they're saying, how dare you lecture us? You are steeped in sin and therefore you are ignorant and oblivious to what's really going on. And now that's going to play out again. We're going to see that when Jesus applies that then to the Pharisees. Now, when he has thrown him out, he goes and he finds him so that he can have an encounter, but learn more about who Jesus is. And he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, this is a huge challenge. This is a different statement. The, the Son of Man is a reference to Daniel chapter 7. The Son of Man, someone born like the Son of Man who will come and restore all things. And he says to him, Sir, or Lord, this is, this is a very special word, uh, Kyria. Um, he says to him, Sir, tell me that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have seen him. In fact, right now, this is that, and I know that it's not translated there. I am that ego emi, emi that Yahweh is the one speaking to you. I am is speaking to you. And the man says, Lord, right now he goes from sir to Lord, I believe. Right? Why? He had a personal encounter and he knows who he is. He is the son of man. And then look at the, look at the ultimate culmination. This is now the first time you see this. And he worshiped him. Well, Jews only worship God. And so now it isn't that he just wants to be a disciple. He wants to be a follower. He has had a powerful life-altering experience. He has the wisdom. He now knows and is growing and he worshiped him. So now you have the culmination of discipleship. A personal experience, wisdom to know who he is, and who Jesus is. And Jesus goes on, now that he has made that ultimate in this whole journey, he said, for judgment, for division, for separation, I have come into the world, because judgment has already started in this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Right? Now he's talking about spiritual blindness, the Pharisees. You, you're blind. You think you can see, but you are already blind. And because you do not acknowledge that you are blind, your blindness remains. And so, of course, the Pharisees are, heard them and said, what, are you t saying that we're blind too? They don't know. How would they know? How could they tell? How would they know the difference? They're in the darkness. This is that sense in which John says, when you're in the darkness, you are oblivious. You say dumb things. What are we blind to? And Jesus kind of drops the hammer on all of us, for all of us. If you were blind, you would not be guilty because you would know it and you would come to me and I would help you to see. But now that you claim that you can see, you, you, you're ignorant of your own spiritual condition because you pride yourself on your position and on your self-righteousness your guilt remains. I can't help those who do not want to be helped. I cannot do for you. The blind man at the beginning knew that he was blind. Everybody knew that he was blind. And he was begging, and Jesus healed him. And so his guilt was taken away. But if the man never knew, he would never want to be healed. Right? Jesus can only forgive those who want to be forgiven. And so the Pharisees here at the very end are blind. And so what Jesus is saying is the light of the world has come, but only those that can see the difference between the light and the dark. Right? So this is the challenge then for all of us, to experience the power of the light in our lives. The more that we are part 
right? It, it says in Psalm 119, thy word is a light to my path. It illuminates the world in which we live. The more time we spend in God's word, the more it illuminates our lives, who we are. And the question is, is are we blind or are we like this man? We're beginning to see, not perfectly, but we're beginning to see the world better because Jesus is, is guiding us, right? For judgment I came into the world that those who see, those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Well, friend, it is a beautiful story, a narrative of blindness following all the way through and the impact and transformation of a true disciple. Do you find yourself in this story? Do you find yourself becoming more aware, seeing the world through Jesus' eyes. Well, friends, I hope this has blessed you. I hope that you'll share it with somebody in our church that we can get everybody involved in God's Word. Well, friends, I pray that the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit will rest upon you and give you peace. Hey, friends, until next time, God's blessings.